911 emergency. Can you help her, please? Okay, what's going on? I don't know. He was shot. He was shot? I don't know. The Toys R Us? Is he inside? Yes. Is there anybody else there? Yes, I have two other guys with me. Oh, my God. Was he there with you? Oh, my God. Okay, what's going on there? Who, who's there with you? Two of the staffers. I'm a staffer, and we had a manager. He opened at 4 o'clock. We were on loading trucks. And, and where was the manager when this happened? He not to let somebody in. Okay. And then another guy just told me the toy store was open, and that's how one of the other doctors got in. Okay, is he alive? I don't know if he's alive. Just before 6 a.m., officers from the Hamburg Police Department responded to the 911 call at the Toys R Us store and entered the building with their guns drawn, expecting to encounter an active shooter. As they entered the manager's office in the back of the store, they found a man slumped over in an office chair. The man had a faint pulse and was clearly in critical condition. The officers dragged him out of the store and put him in an ambulance. A SWAT team was called in to clear the store and make sure the perpetrator was no longer inside. Once it was determined that he was gone, detectives began their investigation. The victim was identified as 35-year-old Larry Wells. Larry was born and raised in Dunkirk, New York, and was married to his high school sweetheart, Jill. Larry and Jill had been together since they were just 15 years old and had a four-year-old daughter by the name of Madison. Jill describes Larry as a devoted husband and a very loving father who would do anything for his daughter Four-year-old Madison was his pride and joy. He played dress-up with her and would goof around to make her laugh. On his days off, Larry would surprise Madison by taking her to Chuck E. Cheese, just to see her smile and be filled with joy. His cousin described him as a big kid who loved toys. When Larry and Jill attended college together, Larry decided to pursue a career in teaching. After graduating with a degree in elementary education, he went on to work as a substitute teacher in his local school district. Everyone who knew Larry only had good things to say about him. Students and teachers who got to know him from school described him as funny and kind and said that he made learning fun for his students. As he looked for a more steady position as a teacher, Larry supplemented his income by tutoring kids and working part-time at the local Toys R Us store. He quickly climbed the ranks at Toys R Us and eventually put aside his teaching career when he was offered a full-time position as the store manager. Earlier that year, Larry and Jill were pleasantly surprised when they learned that they had a second baby on the way. It was another girl. Larry told his wife that he liked the name Peyton. His second daughter was given that name, but Larry would never get to see her. Police got word from the hospital that Larry had just passed away. It turned out that he wasn't shot. He had three stab wounds in his chest, one of which proved to be fatal. Larry had just been robbed of his life, and his family were robbed of a son, a husband, and a devoted father. Detectives needed to act quickly to find out who was responsible for this and bring them to justice. When police first entered the office, they heard the sound of a phone that was left off the hook. There was blood on the chair, the floor, and all over the walls. Something stood out on the floor. It was a Florida Gators championship hat that didn't look like it belonged in an office setting. The hat was collected and sent to a lab to be swabbed for DNA. The next step for detectives was to question Larry's co-workers. The store was closed at the time of the attack and there were four other employees in the building, all of which are now suspects. The first person to be questioned was the woman who placed the 911 call. She tells detectives that all five employees arrived early that morning to receive a shipment and stock the shelves. All of the doors were supposed to be locked until opening time, but at around 5 a.m., the woman found one of the front doors had been opened. She went to Larry's office to see if he'd opened it for some reason, and that's when she found him and called 911. The other employees were also questioned. All of their stories matched, and nothing seemed to stand out about their behavior. Detectives noticed surveillance cameras all throughout the store and needed to see what they've captured. Toys R Us sent their regional loss prevention manager, a man by the name of Bernard Grusha, who met the officers at the store to give them access to the footage. A few minutes after Larry clocks in, he can be seen in the stockroom letting in the truck driver who arrived with the shipment, then letting him back out a half hour later. The camera closest to the front door, which was found open, doesn't have a clear view of the entrance, but it did capture something of interest at 424 that morning. A person can be seen standing behind the door very briefly before they force the door open and gain entry into the store. 
The person was wearing a black outfit, but not much else is clear on the video. After entering the store, he sneaks toward the back, where Larry's office is. As he cautiously makes his way through the electronics section, another camera gets a better look at them. The suspect is holding what appears to be a large knife in his right hand. At 4.32, he's picked up by a camera pointed at Larry's office. He enters the office, which is empty at this point, and shuts the door behind him. Detectives continue watching the footage, waiting for Larry to appear when suddenly, the screen goes dark. The DVR cable inside the office was unplugged at 4.39 a.m. The crucial footage that police were looking for doesn't exist. The DVR cable was collected and sent to a lab to be swabbed for DNA. While waiting for the DNA results, detectives reviewed the footage frame by frame, hoping to catch something they've missed. As the suspect makes his way to the manager's office, he seems to be familiar with the layout of the store and avoids each camera as much as possible. As he enters the office, white writing can be seen along his pants, though it wasn't very clear. He has a very distinct walk and seems to have a bow-legged gait. The moment he gets closest to a camera, a hat can be seen on his head. The hat looks very much like the one found in the office. At this point, detectives knew they probably had DNA, and they were right. Not only was a DNA profile found on the hat, but the same one was also found on the DVR cable, and it didn't match Larry's. Police are confident that they have the killer's DNA and now need to find out who it belongs to. Detectives ran it through the national database, but there were no matches. The next step was to compile a long list of everyone who could have been involved in Larry's murder and ask each of them for a DNA sample. One by one, samples were collected from Larry's friends and co-workers, and with each negative match, suspects were ruled out. As weeks turned to months, progress on the case started to slow, and Larry's family stopped getting any updates. Police started looking at criminals who haven't provided DNA to law enforcement, and one person stood out. This person had just recently been released from jail. At the time of his arrest, he was driving a car that belonged to a Toys R Us employee and was carrying a large knife. Undercover FBI agents tracked him down and kept a close eye on him, waiting for him to discard something with his DNA. They retrieved a cigarette butt that he flicked out of his car, but when it was tested, his DNA didn't match the suspects. Detectives were back to square one and were starting to feel pressure from Larry's loved ones, who haven't heard anything for three months. Look at my mom at these places where we went to. Yep. Peyton never met her dad, but Jill and Maddie will make sure she knows him. Daddy book. Yep, Yankees. That's what it's favorite. What is it about him that you're going to miss the most? Mommy. Just being able to tell him everything. You know, watching it with, with Maddie and, you know, I'm not going to be able to see it with Peyton, but I mean, that's what I miss the most. Jill says they'll never forget, but they will have to move forward. She'll stay strong for these girls and make sure there is happiness in their lives. She says that's exactly what Larry would want. He just loved, he loved everyone, you know, he loved, he loved us. They re-examined the list of people who were asked for DNA samples and realized that there was one person who hadn't provided his. Every time he was scheduled to meet with police to provide his DNA, something always came up and he'd reschedule. The person was Bernie Grusha, the loss prevention manager at Toys R Us, the same man who came in on the day of Larry's murder and gave police access to the store's surveillance footage. The last time police tried to meet with Bernie, he told them that he was at a work conference and would reach out to them as soon as he returned. When detectives called his employer, they confirmed that he wasn't actually attending a conference. Bernie was tracked down to his father's house and detectives went to pay him a visit. After getting a sample from him, one of the officers noticed something interesting in the driveway. One of the cars parked outside had a bumper sticker on it. It was a Florida Gators sticker, the same team on the hat that was left at the scene. Bernie was starting to look suspicious, but when the DNA results came in a few months later, he became the prime suspect in Larry's murder. Bernie's DNA matched the DNA that was found on the hat and on the DVR cable. Police went back to confront him with the evidence, and this time, their body cameras were recording. As soon as they sit down, detectives pull out photos of the hat and place them in front of him. These are the two photos that I wanted to show you. Just to see if anything sticks out here. I mean, you can see the guys wearing the hat. Right. You ever see any, any employees or anybody in the store? Nothing like that. Nothing. Bernie denies knowing anything about the hat. 
He's then asked why his DNA was on the power cord that was pulled out right before the murder. You know the DVR, the uh, hard drive part of it wasn't pulled out because we watched the video. Right, right. The power cord was pulled out. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. You know DNA was found on that side of the power cord? Right. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, I want to do good. It is plausible that Bernie could have left his DNA on the power cord while he was working, but if he had nothing to do with the murder, there's no reason it would be found all over the hat. Detectives confront him about this. There's, there's one other issue, okay. and it's, it's a major issue. Okay. You never saw the hat, you don't know who's in that video. Okay. How is your DNA on that hat? There's no DNA on the hat. Mm -hmm. There's no idea. The only thing I could think of was the fact that I saw it. But it makes no sense. I think this got out of hand and something that you didn't intend occurred that morning. Holy Guys, I didn't do it. Solaris. This is your opportunity. Guys, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I don't know what you want to say. You, I, I'm not going to say I did it, but I didn't do it. You, you made a mistake that morning. Don't make another one today. Detectives up the pressure, and Bernie starts to get defensive. Whatever, guys. You say Bernie. Great. I didn't do it. Not great. Because the only way you got I don't know how it could be because you had it on when you watched. Bad as whatever you guys have looks or whatever. I didn't do it. Look past it. You know what? Fine. You need to get past it, too. This is crazy. You need to get past it. I know the camera. Right. I know the system. If right. I did this, it'll play. I would have. As soon as he asked for a lawyer, detectives had to stop questioning him. At this point, they either need to leave the house or arrest him. <laughs> Yep. Police are confident that Bernie was the killer and arrest him. As he was being held in custody, officers executed search warrants for his house, his father's house, and his girlfriend's house, looking for evidence tying him to Larry's murder or something to help them understand why he would want him dead. They would find both. At his house, detectives found boxes in his garage stacked to the ceiling. The boxes were filled with toys, video games, and high-priced electronics such as cameras that all appeared to be from Toys R Us. In one of the cameras, police found an SD card. The card contained hours of video that were secretly recorded at various stores to monitor employees and make sure they weren't stealing. One of the videos was recorded in Bernie's house when he seemed to have inadvertently left it on. In the video, Bernie can be seen walking toward the camera with a distinctive gait which looked very similar to the suspects. The most damning part of the video, however, was his choice of clothes that day. He had on a pair of black pants with white writing along the left leg, just like the suspect. It became obvious that Bernie was the killer, and he was quickly charged with second-degree murder. But detectives still needed to find out why in the world he would want Larry, of all people, dead. Police started digging, and details about Bernie's life started to surface. After earning his college degree in 1997, Bernie married his wife Heather and started working in retail. A year after their marriage, the couple had a child together and began to invest in rental properties. By 2007, Bernie landed his job at Toys R Us with a decent annual salary of $90,000 and grew his real estate business. He acquired eight properties that he collected rent from, and his investments paid off. Bernie was able to pay a half million dollars to build a brand new house for his wife and three kids. The house had high ceilings, 4,000 square feet of space, an in-ground pool that attracted all the neighborhood kids in the summer, and a brand new Escalade that was kept parked in the driveway. Life was good for the Grushas, until it wasn't. In 2008, just a year after Bernie landed his job at Toys R Us, the housing market crashed homeowners all around the country suddenly saw their property values evaporate overnight. Bernie had all of his wealth tied up in real estate, which was now worth a fraction of what it was, and he could no longer afford his properties. To make matters worse, that very same year, his wife Heather was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
Medical bills, credit card bills, and unpaid utility and tax bills from eight rental properties were piling up and reached over $1.2 million in debt. Bernie and his wife had no choice but to sell all of their rental properties and file for bankruptcy. It wasn't long before their marriage also took a hit. Over the following years, police were called to the Grusha's home multiple times, the last of which happened just two weeks before Larry's murder. Bernie's wife called the sheriff's office to report that he discharged his gun out of a bedroom window after they got into a heated argument. He was arrested and ordered by a judge to move out of the house. When he was released, Bernie rented his own house with a co-worker that he started dating. At some point, Bernie started to steal from the very stores he was being paid to prevent theft from. By comparing against missing inventory from Toys R Us, the merchandise found in his garage was traced back to multiple stores throughout New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. As part of his plea deal with prosecutors, Bernie came clean about everything and detailed what happened the day he killed Larry. With mounting pressure from debts he had piling up, he started stealing from Toys R Us and sold the stolen goods on eBay. He used his access to the stores to steal cash and merchandise, and used his position as the manager of loss prevention to cover up his crimes. According to Bernie, this is what happened on the morning of June 29th. He arrives at the store wearing all black and has his face covered. He fiddles with the door for a while to make it look like someone broke in, but he actually used his key. After sneaking over to the back of the store, he walks into the manager's office and unplugs the cameras as he waits for Larry to walk in. He intended to hold him at knife point and force him to open up the safe, but it didn't happen the way he planned. As soon as Larry saw him there holding a knife, he immediately fought back and tried to disarm him. During the struggle, Bernie's hat was knocked off of his head. When Larry reached for his face covering to pull it down, Bernie stabbed him three times in his chest, then ran off. Larry had apparently picked up the phone to call for help, but he likely lost consciousness before he could even dial a number. By the time the female employee found him, it was already too late. Just a few hours after killing Larry, Bernie returned to the store to play the surveillance footage for the detectives and was seen standing outside of the store, crying and consoling other employees. He even attended Larry's funeral several days later and offered his condolences to his family members and then burglarized three more stores over the following weeks. As part of his plea deal, Bernie admitted to stealing cash and merchandise from his employer and pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter. He was ordered to pay $223,000 in restitution and was sentenced to 25 years for the murder of Larry Wells. Bernard Grusha is currently housed in Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York and won't be released before 2035.